All right, wonderful. Well, on behalf of uh, the Ingham County Commission, the Tri-County Regional Planning Commission, and the Mid Michigan Program for uh, Greater Sustainability, my name is Brian McGrain. I'm the Vice Chair of the Tri-County Regional Planning Commission, and I'm just so excited to welcome you all. This is a, a huge, great crowd on a, on a Tuesday evening. I'm very excited to welcome you all to the uh, report out session, our first uh, wrap-up session for this work, first week of, uh, of what we've been doing this past week, for these last couple days, for the uh, Charette project, for the Charette sessions that we've been doing around the Michigan Avenue and Grand River Avenue uh, corridor visioning session. I'm hearing great things already. I'm really excited to see all the work that's been going on. And again, like I said, I'm just so excited to see so many people from not only my neighborhood, my friends, my neighbors, my colleagues, but people from across the region, because as we all know, Michigan Avenue and the Grand River Corridor are so critical to our region. They really are the main street for our entire tri-county region. We've had some great talent in uh, uh, helping us this week, uh, leading us through this process. I'm excited to bring up Bill Leonard's from the National Charette Institute, who's gonna kind of kick things off. And uh, I know we're all excited to get right into to their draft work here and start giving additional feedback and just kind of see what they've presented. So, Bill, please come on up. notes here because uh, I'm so tired. <laughs> we, you know, I was adding up the number of hours. I think we logged maybe 100, 750 people hours on our end. Yeah. And in terms of the public, over 60 hours of time when people were coming in and out over the week. So that's a lot of time and a lot of work. Um, anyway, I want to thank you for inviting us to serve your community. Uh, the National Charette Institute is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. Uh, we research, teach, and run charrettes as a way for people to come together and work on their communities. Uh, we've been around for a few years here in this part of the state. Uh, the Michigan State Housing Development Authority has had us conducting a series of charrette trainings over the past couple of years. Uh, we set the standard for charrettes, but you know what? Michigan is setting the standard for planning. We get around, right? And I can tell you, that what's going on in this state is unique. The way that this state is pulling together in the placemaking initiative to pull agencies together and communities together to do this kind of thing is very unique, so you're going to be applauded for that. In fact, from the beginning of this project, the partners in it had the idea of a transparent community design process. From the very beginning, charrettes were discussed. So they turned to us, Sue Pig and Paul Hamilton, from Tri-County, asked the Charette Institute to guide the charrette process through this corridor vision. Okay, so the first thing is, the first thing was, I've been around for a while, so I figured I better get a Spartan on my team. And so, we found Lynn Wilson. Lynn works for Mead and Hunt. Yeah. She works for Mead and Hunt here in Lansing. She was born and raised in East Lansing, went to MSU, and she knows the lay of the land. And I feel very comfortable going back to Portland, Oregon, knowing that Lynn is here, along with the Tri-County folks, to really stay connected with the community. So that was our first smart move. Our second smart move was to hire these guys, Dover Cole and Partners. As you're going to see tonight, Dover Cole is an internationally recognized planning and design firm. For 26 years, they've been working on corridor planning like this and doing a lot of work in university communities just like yours. So they have a track record for producing realistic vision plans that can really get things built. So before we start, I just wanted to thank a few people. Uh, I wanted to thank Lori Mullins from East Lansing, who got us the Charette team is really applauding because we were sitting on these chairs, there were these plastic chairs, okay, and how many hours did I say? 750 people hours. And Lori said, you need some better chairs. And she brought us these really comfy chairs from upstairs. That was great. But she also hooked us up with Mike Bailey and Joe Hooker from City, City Center Properties, who got us the excellent Charette space. Thank you for that. Uh, we also wanted to thank Sue's staff at Tri-County. Uh, and the staff from the MSU Land Policy Institute who are around a lot to help and advise us. Okay, so let's get on with it. Victor is going to come up here. So get prepared to be inspired, folks. He's going to take us through a summary of what happened this week and where we're going to go. Victor? Thank you, Bill. 
Good evening, everyone. How's that sound, Luke? Thank you. All right, great. Well, thank you for having us here tonight. As Bill said, um, the whole team is a little staggered by the, both the overwhelming input and the hours over the last few days. So you're listening to a disassembled skeleton of a lot of ideas that came from you or things we couldn't help noticing as urban designers. But, and no one, no one on planet Earth has seen this whole presentation from one end to the other before because we literally are showing you fresh ink. These are things that we were just finalizing this afternoon and putting into the, into the digital presentation. Uh, so let's, let's take a look. What we're gonna do first um, for those who are new tonight, and for those who might have been along for part of the ride, uh, but want to hear more about what went on in the other session, I'm going to give you a, a, a pretty fast recap of the events during uh, this week. Then I'll linger on a slide with words, it'll be the only one with a lot of words on it, that has an attempt to verbally state the simplest distilling of the hundreds of ideas that we've heard into a set of core principles or cornerstones, as we've called them. Then we'll take a little tour together of places along the corridor and ask the question, what if it were like this? Or if it were like that? At times we'll be looking three or four or five years into the future. And at other times we'll be looking 20 or 30 or 50 years into the future. So uh, get ready for that. It, it um, should be fun. You'll have opportunities to stop uh, toward the end of that to give us some specific feedback on the late-breaking ideas or the newest drawn version of our attempt to make many plans into one. And at the end, um, Amy and I will give you just a couple of things to remember about what happens next. First, it, it's, it's incredibly obvious by geometry that the founders of your settlement intended for this corridor to be the most important street in the region. You can see the Capitol here, and then you can see Michigan Avenue extending off uh, into the east, saying, here's the route. Here's our mark on the planet. Uh, this is where we are as a people. This is where we're going to transact our business. This is where we're going to make our homes. And this is where we're going to, where we're going to operate our democracy. And so the geometry is more than symbolic. It's also incredibly efficient. They set it up as a way of getting things done. And so we're going to look at, at the uh, process of the future of the corridor and say, how can we come up with a vision you can implement that is worthy of that high ambition of your founders? Here's a quote from one of our Charette participants this week who said, find a way to put the Grand in Grand River Avenue again. Uh, so it helps to stop and look back at that. We are at times going to be talking about things that are very utilitarian. How do you walk comfortably from here to there? Or how do you quickly move in your vehicle or in transit or your bike? How do you set up a business on the corridor efficiently to make money or create jobs? How do you live in a place where it's convenient uh, and sociable? So sometimes we're going to talk about very utilitarian things. Other times, we'll be talking about the symbolism of it. How to, how to leave a mark or legacy in this place that's worthy of the work of your town founders. I couldn't help but notice as I walked in this beautiful building that was built in 1926. So it was built a year before my parents were born. Probably around the time many of your parents or grandparents were born. And uh, at that time, Every time somebody put one brick on top of another, or made a move in the built environment, like building a civic building, or drawing a line on a map and saying, that's where we'll put the main street, they did so with a very long-term vision that they were leaving behind something that would send messages, not just contain square footages. And so, uh, let's think that way as we look at the, at the corridor together. Now, zoom out a little bit in the corridor at the bottom in the, in the west, and then Michigan Avenue, leaving Grand River and extending on all the way to Weberville. This image of a view you can only really get uh, from a very high altitude uh, aircraft 
is meant to convey one idea, which is that you are, in fact, all in this together. That you have one fundamental economic unit. The, the dollar bills going back and forth, and the jobs going back and forth, human beings, they might have a vague idea where the city limits are between one township and the next, or one city and the next. The water droplets have no idea. The air molecules have no idea. I bet the dollar bills don't really know either. So you are, in fact, all in this together uh, as you live and work around the corridor. Now, we have forced ourselves. It's actually difficult for urban designers because we want to get right to the detail about the curb radius and the planting of the tree detail and exactly where the build to line is for the storefront. But we have tried to force ourselves to stay up in that high altitude helicopter and think first about the big picture. Because when we come back in October, for the next round of this, the second charrette in the two-part series, we're going to be zooming in. So for this week, a draft vision for the 20 or 21 miles as a whole. And not just the right-of-way or the immediately in front of the properties, but going a half a mile in each direction, thinking about whole neighborhoods that are affected and bound together by the corridor. When we come back, we're going to pick three, or it, okay, as we could before, three specific small areas where we'll draw them in more detail together, we'll work more closely with the property owners or the officials um, that have um, authority over those places. We'll try to get much more specific than what we see tonight. So if you didn't already know about it, there is a second round. It is in October, the last week of October, uh, and we hope you'll all participate in that. I can't wait. Now, there is one word that's more important than any of the other words I present to you tonight, and that's the word draft. It's just a draft. Repeat after me. Draft. <laughs> exactly. That's the important word. Okay. So, what we want you to do tonight is remember that you will have an opportunity to give more feedback. A couple of ways. We've got the keypad polling devices. Uh, more of them are on the way. And we all have a paper questionnaire for the end of tonight's meeting. And you can keep giving ideas one-on-one -on -one to members of the team uh, or members of the Tri-County staff or the other stakeholders that are part of this project. Plus, you'll be able to go onto the website. Uh, I'll give you that website address again in a few minutes. And uh, contribute ideas very directly there. You can go find this project via Twitter or Facebook. There are a lot of avenues through which uh, you can continue to give feedback after tonight. So, it's just a draft. Now, does that seem sufficiently non-threatening? You want to hear it one more time? Okay. The reason I emphasize that is because we know it's not right yet. Okay? So, just so you remember, I, it's, a, it's a message I delivered on Wednesday night as well. It's impossible to get it all right the first time. So, squint your eyes a little bit, look at it a little blurry, and instead of arguing about the doorknob details, of one little piece, with the color of the shutters on one of the drawings, keep your heads zoomed out as well and say, in concept, in principle, is this in the right direction? Now, uh, when we looked at the corridor, we didn't start from scratch. Just remember there's an economist working on the project who's delivering all sorts of data about the commercial uh, potential for retail and office and lodging and that sort of thing. There's another economist and housing specialist who's studying the prospect for residential uh, infill and development and migration and rearrangement of your, of your living uh, in, the, in the region. Uh, they're all doing the number stuff. Plus, we have professional engineers who are checking on things like making sure the traffic works or making sure the bus rapid transit system will function as advertised. Uh, so that all is going on simultaneous with the vision stuff. The vision stuff is more fun. Uh, we also look at the historical documents, the regional plan, very powerful document. Um, the transportation study that was done uh, leading to this concept for the bus rapid transit line, and the Greening Mid-Michigan document, which describes all things sustainability related. Meanwhile, we did step back and look at that project of your founders. You know, it, as the cliche goes, when we Americans were poorer but smarter, how we built places. And it's revealing. If you look at the historic maps, the fire insurance maps from uh, the turn of the century, or this map from 1914, and you actually see the fundamental pattern, essentially the genius of the Greater Lansing Plan, which was this interconnected network of blocks and streets, an idea for how the land meets the water, 
an idea for how you use geometry, like that long vista that terminates at the, cast, at the capital, to make some things more important, to put some emphasis on certain parcels of real estate and make them more than just parcels of real estate. Historic photographs are also revealing. Look, what, look here, when uh, the street was largely unpaved or paved in uh, what by modern standards would be considered a crude way, and the drainage system was just getting going and that kind of thing, and trees weren't growing up, but look what they did do. Two things are very important. They positioned buildings where they shaped public space. This is a view of the, of the corridor in the early 1900s, looking east here. And you can see that they put the buildings down where they made a public room out of the street space. And the proportion of their height to the width between them was very pleasing, very agreeable, like Main Street often wanted to be. That's why the multi-story buildings feel good there. That's why the, um, the floor of the, of the public room is less important, in fact, spatially and visually than the wall. The second thing they did that was very important was even in a pioneer stage, and in a pioneer state of mind, they were building very proud architecture, street-oriented architecture. Look at me, stand up straight kind of broad-shouldered architecture, like the masonry buildings, the strong terracotta cornice across the top, the storefront that said, I have merchandise and services in here that are for sale. Very positive, really kind of humble form of the American mercantile style of architecture at that time. But I don't see blank walls. I don't see uh, the, the big spaces. I see pretty much continuity. I don't see parking in the front. I don't see one-story buildings, like little wafers of, of, uh, of buildings sitting a quarter mile from the street. So even at the beginning stage, they were trying to make a place. So you could arrive there, even if a settlement uh, when it was this coherent, it was only a block or two away. You knew when you were there. Other historic photographs reveal other things. Like this picture that was taken between Lansing and East Lansing describes a time when there was a distinct separation between the cities. When there was town and there was country. And then there was town again. A pattern we can still see in the far eastern part of the corridor, at least for now. But a pattern that's not easy to detect um, where the cities have grown together, um, and so be it. Here's, here's another historic photograph uh, from in East Lansing that describes the town and gown relationship. I think this is really kind of compelling. You can see the streetcar ran at that time um, along the corridor. On the far uh, right of the picture, you can see that. And the Buildings like they are today, always oriented toward that most important neighbor, employer, group of customers, just the faculty and the students on the university campus. So even with Model P's in Grand River Avenue, that relationship was there. Uh, it also uh, didn't look very difficult to cross at that point. There's a little bit later job. It's kind of formalized a little bit more. Again, the street-oriented buildings. You know what's in them. In the 1960s, now formalized it again a, a little more. I find it intriguing. Architecture changed in the meantime, so things got into uh, minimalism. So the, that big terracotta cornice that was at the top of the stand up straight look at me building is gone. Uh, and it's all getting kind of stripped down or clad over in order to uh, simplify. So historic pictures made me stop and think wouldn't it be cool? If a hundred years from now they're referring to this effort, the one you, you contributed to hands on, the one your names will uh, be in the record for having worked on, they thought of it as a turning point or a, a crucial moment of consensus building in the life of the of the corridor. Now you've got the clickers to the sound. Let's let's do a quick find out about where we are. Um, quick poll number one. The first question is, who's here for the first time, really? We want to know if you came to the opening session or to the design studio, which was open around the clock for the last uh, five or six days, or to the open house we held on Sunday afternoon, or to, if you did more than one of those, choose four for multiple events. And if tonight is your first time, that's fine, too. Just, tell, just choose five for that, that this is the first event you've attended. It'll help me understand what I need to recap. recap. 
The poll is open. The last number you pick is your final vote. You have four seconds. Ready? Okay, so half of you came to one or, or two or more events during the course of the week. That helps me know. We did have a big group uh, that wasn't here. So the others of you, bear with me because I am going to make sure they know what went on and how we came to some of the conclusions uh, we tentatively reached. probably didn't see, unless you were out there on your bike the same time as us, or you were wondering why we were walking around with measuring tools and taking photographs of your storefront, uh, was we were out there taking pictures and measuring things and trying to get a good catalog going of all the existing physical conditions. And so we were clambering around on roofs, and we were climbing up ladders. Thank you to Tim Potter from MSU for getting me on that roof. Um, and, and then came uh, the, probably the most important event we had during the week, and that was this opening session Wednesday night at the Lansing, at the Lansing Center. We took a really big gathering of people, and after some background presentation, broke them down into small groups, 10 or 12 at a table, one had a little more, some, a couple had a little less, uh, and asked them to work together for around 90 minutes. Uh, and they were full of energy. It was kind of an amazing thing. They worked, broke in small groups. They began doing individual exercises and then trends um, um, ascended from individual work to working as a group. They hovered over maps, first looking at the big picture, then at close-ups. Uh, it was, uh, sometimes these things require a little squinting. Diane, thank you for coming over and over. Uh, she's been a stalwart this week. Um, but the idea of that was to take the big, big group and see if by working in a series of smaller groups we could find out more than you ever get from, say, a public hearing where each person has one turn at the microphone for 120 minutes, 20 seconds each. Um, so that's the, that's the way it worked, kind of working in parallel instead of in serial. This is one of the key ideas the National Charette Institute emphasizes uh, in their training. So we demonstrated that idea. How many of you ever heard that, um, of John Wesley? He's the theologian who founded the Methodist Church. He said, we only progress spiritually in small groups. I think it might be true urbanistically as well. So we, we went to a small group format for Wednesday night and asked people to work. And then we regathered where everybody could see one at a time and each group made a presentation. See one of those going on right here. And while those presentations happened, the video cameras zoomed in on the drawing where they had marked up a map and blew that up on the big screen so everybody could see what they had drawn or written on the map uh, as they presented. And we also took notes while that was going on uh, and projected the notes so everybody could see what we were recording. And it was a chance to visualize what was common between each of these presentations, one after another. So a lot of common threads. Now after that, we went over to the old Barnes & Noble space, or for others, uh, they remember it as the old Jacobson space, before it was Barnes & Noble, and um, set up a kind of camp-out design studio in that big empty space. Uh, so we got the computers there, and a lot of room to draw, and, uh, and a couple of tables arranged as a makeshift conference room, and we had a series of technical topic meetings. Um, they were... Uh, focused on issues like transportation, or environmental quality, or uh, housing, or economic development, and what have you. So the design team was working right beside there, and could hear, go over here these meetings, was getting constant feedback on what was going on. So my business partner Joe Cole here, Justin Falango in the background, drawing away or working on the computer while these meetings were going on, and getting a sense of the details on these technical topics. How many do we have? Fourteen? Fourteen of those technical topic meetings. Uh, so the designers um, were also able to interact with uh, specialists. So here, Barb Aaron and Hannah Remsma, they're, they're traffic engineers, um, transportation engineers, excuse me, and uh, Barb. Um, and so the designers were feeding them an idea. How, would, how could this work? Or what if the bus rapid transit worked this way? What if the cross-section of the street uh, in front of Sparrow Hospital was this way, that kind of thing. And then they would sit down and work it out and uh, crunch numbers and give us feedback on what was or wasn't workable. Um, so there you go. 
And while it was going on, we had a stream of people, really a parade, of people coming in and out of the door uh, on an informal basis, uh, sometimes filling out a questionnaire or leaving behind their contact information or getting in close and looking again at that drawing they saw on Wednesday night down by another table. We had a lot of participation from agency staff, from MSU, from a whole range of stakeholders while we were doing this. And they were great. They looked after us, they fed us, which we appreciate uh, while we were working. At the open house, um, we were able to actually go back and check some of the things that we were you know, beginning to shape up as conclusions against the feedback we had received on Wednesday night. Meanwhile, we sent an away team to Patton Gill Middle School and said, I wonder what the fifth graders think about this. And so a team of, of spirited fifth graders uh, actually tackled the same task that the adults had done on Wednesday night. Uh, and came back with some very interesting results. You know, um, middle schoolers are unbelievably capable urban designers. They know, put the place where you can get a cone of ice cream, close to the place where you can play in the park, close to the place where you can live, and where you can walk in between those or, or your school. That's what they describe. And, you know, they had they they are very natural about it. They're not bashful at all. I said, of course I want to walk. I'm not old enough to drive. And they, and they designed it that way. So, Walkable Communities Agenda uh, starts young. I, I think it's also a good thing for the design team to hear their messages, which were all very carefully documented, by the way. Because in a way, it's the puppies for whom we build these dog houses in the master plans. Take a while to unfold. I'm going to take a little detour here and tell you about uh, one experience we had, which is doing a handlebar survey. In windshield survey, it's a term for something planners learn to do in planning school. They teach us to get out of the cubicle and get in a car and drive around, to go actually go out and drive over there and see the real world for which we're doing the planning work. It's called a windshield survey because we don't slow down too much in case somebody figures out that's a city car you're driving. And then uh, and you try to remember what it's all really about when you go back to the abstract world of maps. My friend Mike Lydon. Uh, recommended that we start doing something he called the handlebar survey. Because it's good to get out there and drive, but it's even better to get out from behind the wheel and uh, get on a bike and see the place at a slower pace. You can also get a chance to see the place as it works or doesn't for pedestrians and cyclists. Here, Marcy McAnally, our livable streets uh, specialist uh, working with us this week, um, was doing the handlebar survey thing over on Regent Street, just off Kalamazoo, and I snapped her picture. The end of our survey was, was encouraging in some ways. There are beautiful things, things that you can't see when you go by at 55 miles an hour because, as Robert Persick said, when you're just looking at it through a windshield, it's all more television. You take a car out from around you and you, look, you stand in the oxygen of the actual real world on the sidewalk or in the street, you see the place differently. You slow down and actually appreciate what people spent time building. Um, and they stood on the Capitol steps and we looked down that grand vista and that's when I became convinced we should start the presentation the way I did. And you can see the symbolism that they built into the built environment. You can also see the care people have <coughs> uh, giving their environment. They may only have the ability to control the tidiness of their own home or the flowers in their own garden, but their piece of the world in your community reveals a lot of pride, private place. You see it in block after block. This is on Fairview Avenue. Or when you go, I, I, I actually got the chance to bike uh, from uh, downtown East Lansing and all, all the way west to and around the Capitol and back on Kalamazoo and so on, and then, uh, and then all the way east to Weberville and back, taking some new tours as I went. And I learned a lot in that ride that I just would not have gotten uh, by driving back and forth. You stand in the street in Williamson and you can see that same private place. Or you can stop by the side of the road in the country environment where the farms and the long vistas are still intact uh, between uh, Williamson and Weberville and you can see that private place. Or you can stop, uh, as I did on Cornell Road, now this is interesting. This is at the intersection of Cornell Road and Heirloom View. 
When I got back to town, I saw the headline. <laughs> Do I need to stop right there? I'm going to go ahead and step in it. Um, the heirloom view is there because the trees are there. The heirloom view is there because the street is not over designed. Safety is an issue, and now and then, upgrades to improve um, the, the place so that crashes in the middle of the night, terrible tragedies, uh, don't happen. But it's not the best solution. It's not the best solution to start with the assumption that to make things safer, you need to make them faster. Like, what if, as I like to say, what if, in the name of safety, because someone, every once in a while, might drive unsafely or criminally fast, dangerously fast, because someone might do that now and then, what if, in the name of safety, you widen the road and shave off all of the bumps, and then you move the ditches outward, and you cut down all the trees that are within 15 feet of the new road? Well, for one thing, you guarantee that almost all of us will go faster than we should, if not criminally fast, almost every time. So that counterintuitive move was worrisome when I got back to town and discovered that the heirloom view was only an heirloom for now and might not be inherited by the next generation. To illustrate what I mean, when in the name of, of high speed we push everything farther from streets, and we widen up, up the asphalt, push things back, push the nearest buildings back, minimize the impact of any one thing on another. We, um, some call the wide paved shoulders quite generous. The bike lane others call it the cell phone recovery zone <laughs> for recovering your control of the wheel while you're making your car. And they're, they're little, I appreciate Kata's um, determination. You know, they've got the bus stop out there, and the shelter is there. But look at the pedestrian environment around it. Uh, this is what happens uh, when roads get over-designed or the pride of place is lost. Moving closer to town on that handlebar survey, I got to this spot, which is in the Meridian Township. I'm just a little bit to the east of the mall, and I'm looking toward the west, toward uh, Okemos Road, toward Marsh Road, and then Okemos Road in the distance. And the whole thing that you could read in the built place on Fairview or on Regent or on Grand River Avenue in East Lansing or in Williamston or in Weberville, hard to see here. When you get back to town, something happens. Things move close together again, and, uh, and it's a kind of a, a concentration point for ideas to flow, for innovations to meet traditions, um, and with the tension that inevitably comes from that. So there's something pretty exciting about knowing when you're town, and knowing when you're country, and designing the town the town-like way. In the open house, we had people from all walks of life come in and look over our shoulders um, asking questions. Why did you do that? Why would that line go there? How come? Um, and they got to interact with the urban designers and the generalists, but also with the specialists. We also have all the maps on display, so people could come back to the Wednesday night conversations and see them close up and ask questions about them. So we surround ourselves with the map. Now, some of you did this exercise. We passed out little green cards, and they asked questions like, can you state one word that comes to mind when you think of the place today, uh, or how you might improve it, strengthen it in the future? Or name a place that you've visited that has an image or character or sense of place like the one you think this one should have, or what should be the top priority, or uh, what's your suggestion? We stated them different ways to see if we'd get different kinds of answers. What's really remarkable when you look at the whole collection of these cards is how consistent the response was. Not mind you, from a self-selected group of individuals who come to nerdy planning meetings like, like us. Um, but the people who are interested in a very sophisticated language, you know, somebody actually asking for nodes. Uh, a node, that's pretty good. Um, in terms of planning for it. Now, how many of you did this exercise with the red and green dots? Just to see a quick show of hands. Okay. And now I'm going to show you the results of it. For those who weren't there, we gave out a poster, which had a random sampling of pictures scattered around on the, on the page of all sorts of things. Commercial buildings and residential buildings and parking and post offices and what have you. And we gave each individual a handful of red dots 
to mark things it didn't like, and green dots to mark things it did like. And then we collected the results. It's kind of an icebreaker. And they talked with one another to get started about what it was they saw in those pictures. It gave them a green response or a red response. We then went back and picked those pictures out individually, added up their scores, and made some pairs to show you tonight, just an interesting comparison. Here, for example, multifamily housing. Lots of greens on the one on the left. Um, a little bit of green, but mostly red on the one on the right. Interestingly enough, the one on the left is denser, bigger, closer to the road, taller, <coughs> older, because it does also, um, you know, have a kind of architectural language. But, um, but look at the difference between the spores in these two things. But if we were just looking at an abstract zoning map, they'd both be the same color orange on the map. Multi-family, residential, at less and so number of dwelling units per acre. See that? In fact, the one on the right might, in some of the jurisdictions, be more compliant with, con with <coughs> conventional zoning at the moment because it, it respects the deep front setbacks or the high parking requirements or the three-story height limit or what have you. Whereas the one on the left in that same jurisdiction may, in fact, be illegal on that lot. Uh, something to ponder. So we kept digging at these. Here's some civic buildings for comparison, places of worship in this case. Uh, lots of greens on the one on the left, lots of reds on the one on the right, although not a unanimous response in either case. Well, minimizing the visual impact wasn't one of the objectives in the one on the left. In fact, it's very assertive, very town-like architecture, not afraid for anybody to look at it. Now here's one with, with uh, stores. I think this is a good juxtaposition because the one on the right, with all of its unique design, I'd say downright unprecedented design, has been a lot of time spent on trying to create visual interest in that skyline. Right? In fact, they probably were reviewed rather aggressively by a design review board or by a design review system um, in order to get to that state. And I'm sure that they were tightly regulated in terms of the consistent signage and things like that. Uh, plus all the other things I already mentioned, like setbacks and parking. Got a lot of green on this one, which throws all of those rules out. It, it's actually a box. It's a pretty simple rectangular building. Uh, it doesn't have the deep setbacks. It doesn't even have just one use. It's got something else upstairs besides the retail. Look at this one. And use a big house comparison. Uh, the big house on the right looks like a lot of houses around here. The big house on the left looks like a lot of houses around here. Uh, the one on the right, we have mixed feelings about, right? But it's one of the ones that enshrines on the front of the, the sort of the snout portion of the house, uh, that thing which uh, people wanted to assert as being most important in their lifestyle, which is motoring. Um, and I find also interesting that the one on the left, which some, a lot of people felt like had a little more dignity to it, still a uh, substantial house with a lot with with a lot of pride to it, it's incredibly simple. It's a rectangle in plan with a simple roof shape. Uh, whereas the one on the other side has enough peaks and valleys and roofs and gables for a whole village. <laughs> so somehow being more elaborate didn't actually get people the character that gave them the green dot response. Here's a small house comparison. In the one on the left, the, small, the house is incredibly narrow. It's a room or a room and a half wide on a narrow lot. It has the front porch on the front, so it has that street-oriented architecture kind of solution. And the one on the other side, uh, as the fire station approach, um, it's even a little wider. So in terms of generosity of a small public ground floor floor plan, and it's still pretty tall because it's got all of that roof going up like that. So what, the, the pictures teach us that architecture matters. We can get the plan just right. We can get the zoning just right. We can even get the transportation system just right, but the architectural response is the part that will determine whether people get a community character uh, that they want or not. Here's just another example of a mercantile multi-story building, a couple of two-story buildings. Um, and of course one is rotated 90 degrees to the street and the other faces the street. And we'll come back to this issue of street-oriented architecture. These are post offices. <laughs> 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 Those red. 
<laughs> this one is U.S. Postal Service Standard Prototype 30-A. I'm not kidding, actually. That is what it's called. They've retired the prototype since this was built. They built about 4,000 of them all over the country, and then, and then they decided they weren't very good, and they switched to thir Prototype 30-B. Uh, but that's... Uh, and we've, and this, we've confronted this before. In the little town of Port Royal, South Carolina, they were going to do a 38. And I swear to God, it was exactly like this one. Identical in every gable. And the head of real estate for the Postal Service said, well, we know you're trying to plan something special around your civic buildings and everything, but we are like a fast food restaurant, restaurant chain. That's a direct quote. And we have one standard floor plan, one standard uh, site plan, and However, we will use two different colors of brick, and you may choose any two out of these five. <laughs> and the folks in Port Royal, unfortunately it didn't happen uh, here in the corridor, but the folks in Port Royal said that's not good enough for us, and they redesigned it for them, um, and got a, a more, much more traditional, classical post office wrapped around 30 hours floor plan. Uh, so, a uh, last couple, here's F-hatch housing. And people are always a little nervous, you know, what do you mean? The houses are touching each other, like row houses, or townhouses, or live-work units. Um, but, the, but there was a positive response to the one that had green in the front, and parked in the back, and a much more negative response to the one that had the parking in the front, and no clear front door, no clear private outdoor open space. And also slab on grade, as opposed to an elevated finished floor, which gives privacy and dignity to those otherwise close units. Now, one thing you need to know about these pictures is we realize as we lay them out and compare the scores that sometimes people are just responding to green. Like, for example, this one got a lot of green, and that one got a lot of red, and really, you know, they are different in other ways as well. But sometimes the greener picture with tree trees is just going to get a good response. And the bleaker picture of the, of the conventional arterial strip is just not going to get a good response. So we recognize that happens in this unscientific exercise. Is that useful? Is it good to stop and see those results? Okay. Now, the maps that people made, I warned you now, that wouldn't be great works of art, the maps that people made were nevertheless revealed. This map, for example, uh, screamed at us that preserving agricultural and long view shed uh, was a big deal, important to the people in this part of the corridor, uh, just to the west of Williamson. And that the town center, reinforcing the townness where the town center is, is very important to them. I'll show you a couple more. Um, mixed use. Here we are around the mall. Here's the mall. Marsh Road. Um, here's Grand River Avenue and Okemos Road. So to orient you, that's Best Buy. Here's Meyer. Uh, the old Dead Circuit City is there at that intersection. And look what they wrote. Mixed use. Safety and infill. Walkable. Mixed use surrounding the mall. Um, just a description of a different kind of place than the individual building open out a parking lot uh, sort of approach that came with the tent camp stage of development in that place. Well, how about this one out in Weberville? Historic preservation priority on the old school. Um, and preserving a mature tree canopy, or growing a mature tree canopy where it's been lost. Uh, so we get the same kind of detailed responses in these maps. And you can tell by the way people wrote they were being asked to go really fast and also that they were doing it with a lot of energy. Um, let's go, let's speed this up a little bit. Uh, here's the area in Frandor. Um, more commercial, mixed use. Uh, here. This one says Greenway, Greenway. Oh, did you have to say it twice? <laughs> Greenway, Greenway on that one. Um, gateway was another point. Uh, make it more complete was a thing that came out of these handwriting. So what we did next was we took all 14 of those maps and area by area we attempted to make a consolidation map. Which we wrote on them, some of you saw these, uh, a, a little more neatly and all in one hand, area by area, a kind of summary of the themes that were recurring over and over in the 14 groups. We also took the responses to the questionnaires and we made a word cloud. You haven't seen this before. It's a technique for taking a lot of responses and seeing which ones rise to the top and are more common. So here, the words that are bigger and bolder are the responses that were said more often. We've got all the answers but, uh, that people gave us, but the ones that people said were most exciting to them are the ones that pop out. Look, walkable and bikeable. 
greener and tree line. Do something about Frandor. One person said, do something, even if it's wrong. <laughs> just to reassure you, we haven't just summarized, we've also documented all the responses. And we'll turn all of that stuff in. You can actually go to the website and read it, and all the elected officials will have access to all of the data. Every individual response goes into the hopper and gets recorded in these calls. So we passed out another questionnaire tonight. Same thing is true. But for now, what I'm going to attempt to do is give you a short list. Probably a little too long, too many words, we can simplify it together, but um, the things that floated to the top as we get in this crucible. Cornerstone ideas. The biggest one is the top. That instead of just being about transportation, instead of just being about high-speed motoring from A to B, that the places in the corridor themselves are important. It's not just for going through, it's for getting to. And we know that that idea is not new, and it has been part of the planning, for example, in this Lansing uh, and, and Williamson for a long time. But the new idea is that there's a balance to be struck. That transportation might to give a little, especially high-speed, um, free-flowing conditions, peak hour, no congestion motoring, has to give a little in order to make placemaking possible. That's why I showed you the historic pictures because they kind of indicated that that was possible when you weren't overrun with Paul. Second, this isn't really um, one continuous long sausage. We'll talk more about this in a minute. It's a series of distinct places laid end to end uh, that have their own local character, and they have their own local sovereignty. I wish I could tell you how many lectures I got about Michigan Home Rule this week, although I didn't know about it. Um, we know. And, and for those who don't, just to remind you, these local governments have, in, have very powerful jurisdiction over exactly what goes on inside their borders, and they're not about to give that up to anyone else. Okay, so even though we're thinking regionally, some of the ideas you see have to be implemented locally, and that's fine, because you're not trying to extrude one complete, absolutely unified, uniform corridor, you're trying to grow a place that builds on its strengths, and strengths include the fact that Weberville's not the same as Williamson. That's not the same as Meridian and so on. Third, and along those lines, uh, the historic towns, including Lansing and East Lansing and the, and the two small towns, uh, need to be reinforced. Uh, and between them, where they still exist, those rural views are really important. And we realize that Williamson Township, for example, has adopted some pretty aggressive and ambitious policies to keep that being so. It felt like it should be restated here, since it was an idea we heard over and over, uh, and, and to reinforce what they're trying to do. There are many gaps in the teeth, however, in the built-up urbanized areas, the vacant lots and the underutilized real estate and the empty parcels uh, need to be filled in. It's a great way to grow. It's the way to grow that that 1914 map was designed for. Uh, the difference is, you need to get back on track, or stay, stay on track for those places that have already done it, with the street-oriented designs. Uh, because that's how you fulfill the promise of those great addresses. Well, this one, next one's a little complicated. The images we show you tonight are made out of a small amount of public investment that sets the ball rolling, and a huge amount of private investment that only happens when private investors feel they can do so with a reasonable risk and a reasonable return. And so to unlock private investment, you have to have good rules and you have to make strategic capital improvements as, as government so that the right things happen when you spend your money and the right things happen when you make the rules so that the private investors feel like they can build their part of your puzzle. Uh, and uh, so that means some reform. We did get an earful from property owners, developers, would-be investors, business owners, institutional operators, about the need for that. We heard it quite a bit, actually, from staff planners who are on the other side of the counter when plans come sliding across to say, I wish I could do something about that, but I really don't have the tools. In some cases, there have been big, important steps, like the introduction of form-based codes, a better way to design it. Um, and we can talk more about that later, but where that's been started, it needs to be Tweak, built upon, and expanded. Next to last. The suburban commercial arterial strip. 
I said the other night, I'll say again, aging not too gracefully uh, in the place. Every once in a while somebody puts more into um, or scrapes off one of the very temporary looking buildings and puts up a new temporary looking building. But you kind of have to think ahead, how can you set the rules and set the stage and set the story so that those private property owners and those businesses will want to format themselves in a town-like way instead of just a building poking out of parking lot sort of way. And uh, so that's something we'll come back to in a minute. And then last, again, an overarching theme, but if we heard it once, we've heard it a thousand times. People are, are eager to make walking and biking feasible. And for those who are, are enthusiastic about the transit improvements, like the bus rapid transit uh, system, making it walkable and bikeable is how you make the transit succeed. Because when you make a walkable place, you set it up so that transit is possible for people and reasonable for people to use. So we can come back to that list later, but let's look at some pictures. Um, we're going to take a little tour of probably a thing some of you call a string of pearls. We've been several times. A long sausage, if you will, isn't really one thing. There's a series of things like end to end. Actually, one person said, no, a string of pearls isn't the right analogy. Pearls are all the same size, they're all the same color, and they're the same distance apart. I wonder if it's more like a charm bracelet, where in fact their length that they're different. It's another good analogy. So we're thinking that way about that half mile or mile wide swath uh, going across the court. And that fits with the idea of the busway, because the busway will link five very unique uh, employment centers. It'll link 28 very unique addresses uh, along its stops as it goes from the capital uh, down to Meridian Town Center at the end of the line. And the same is true as you get into the rural area and uh, the small town in Williamston and the village in Weatherville. So, we're zooming closer on that. Those areas, of course, are complex and need special focus that have a heart of the heart of town, in each case, that is different from its surroundings. And so that idea of distinctiveness has to play in. And so it's a theme that you'll see uh, as we as we look in closer. There's a zoom in on just the western part of the map that shows the busway as it starts the capital, comes through East Lansing, and comes to the end of the line, open with Meridian, March Road area. Um, while we were looking at the big picture, we tried to assemble into one place uh, several different uh, trails uh, and conservation areas planned. Uh, this is a list of some of the references that we studied. Uh, and then we, we made one map as the first crack at it. Uh, the existing maps tend to focus on bike connections, which is really, really useful. Um, and many of those are on existing roads, which is, which is also important. And they grade them, for example. Yellow for uh, um, off-street, green for a very comfortable route because it's low traffic, red for an uncomfortable or problematic route. And started sketching a possible web of uh, recreational trails that would connect parks and schools. Uh, this is all subject to a lot more study, but I just wanted to let you know that that big picture work is going on. This is a brand new map from this afternoon that was our first attempt to sketch a series of loops uh, that may capture a uh, trail and connectivity ideas, that some of which have been around for a long time, and a few others that are little missing links that seemed worth investigating. So you're going to want to look at that map more closely and people have that posted uh, shortly. Let's start on the east and work our way uh, toward the west. Um, Weatherville is very interesting. It is interesting because it's, it's contained. It doesn't go on forever across the horizon. Uh, part of its livability is your ability to mentally understand it as a whole and know the people in the place. Uh, when I biked out there, I had conversations with the folks in Weatherville about life in that place. And uh, they, you know, they're right to cherish it. It's, it's unique. It's not, it doesn't try to be uh, downtown or East Lansing. Uh, there are big things coming. The drain commissioner told us, for example, about upcoming work rebuilding many of your, much of your drainage system in Weaverville, and uh, that will result in roads being altered, driveways moving around, uh, ditches and culverts changing, some pipes changing. Um, if you get in there and you talk about what you want, maybe it, maybe it will result in some restoration of tree canopy as well. 
I hope you take the cue I just gave. <laughs> the Michigan State University practicing team uh, has been working over the last few months on Weberville, and they assembled an amazing little document um, of all sorts of facts and figures about it, and a, a, a two-page list of recommendations in the form of a sub-area plan for Weberville. So I encourage you to take a look at that. They made a presentation to us about it uh, earlier this week. And we started a kind of naive map. Of, of, you know, it's a big uh, picture kind of map about preserving the, the long views or how the trails and connections go, where expansion, if any, at some point uh, to, exist, to the existing settlement occurs, where those neighborhoods should be. And then, again and again, the priority to infill and restore uh, in the existing homes and workplaces. Moving to Williamson, story sent very similar. We've got a first draft map uh, doing the same kind of thing for that. This is taking your markings on the map and attempting to make a, a diagram. This isn't this is a naive map because it hasn't tried to incorporate everything. Um, well, we, we probably could have found out with more time about the Williamson's official city plan or um, the zoning map and so on. But that, just to start. Um, putting the emphasis on infill and restoration and activity. Small detour here. When I was in Williamson, I in the think, you know, this, this place is, of course, beloved, probably because it's so near perfect. You don't want to mess this up. It's the postcard picture of the corridor, in fact, when you get east of East Lansing. So um, it's really special. There is a place, though, where the trunk line road of M43 meets um, the residential neighborhood. Here you see the curbs and gutters are from the 2002 or so, um, 2002 to 2006 improvement that took place there. Um, and so there's this kind of tension. It's a four lane road, which by the way is less safe than a three lane road. 29% fewer crashes on a three lane road than on a four lane road. Um, it has no more capacity than a three lane road. It's just wow. Wider and faster, and faster is why when we, we stood on the porch with one of the ladies uh, in Williamston and asked her about her street, she said she didn't let her kids uh, ride their bike in this part of her neighborhood, the street in front of her house, uh, because the traffic just goes so fast. It's because there's only a small amount of daily traffic in this section, there never has been enough traffic to justify a four-lane road in that place, and probably never will be. So just I want you to think about that. Just to get up in the air, show you where I'm talking about. Here's the part of town where uh, the junction occurs, uh, the brewery there, and then we were looking at the four lane park, uh, tail later than that, the, right over here. So Andrew Georgiatis uh, quickly did this, uh, this nice painting of that scene, and you can see things in it, like the generous uh, planting strips that are between the sidewalk and the curb here, they're nice and wide, and so. Where there is a tree, it can get nice and big. And uh, you can see remnants of what was originally, like we saw in the historical photographs, a continuous tree canopy uh, down through there. But of course, as trees have been lost to power lines or snowstorms uh, or uh, bulldozers or what have you, they haven't been placed. And you also, in that painting, can still see the wide road with its four lanes and its yellow stripe, a little inconsistent with the idea of the livable residential neighborhood. So um, just uh, to start the conversation, not to impose anything, to start the conversation, we made a what if picture here um, of what if a very, very minor amount of road diet were, were applied here, where the four lane road becomes a three lane road, and then you have room uh, for marked on the street bike lanes. So you don't have to paint those bright green, you don't have to make them garish or elaborate, you no know, drainage would have to be installed to do that. Let's see it again. Before, after. Um, so now the only did was just narrow it visually and encourage people to go the right speed through that neighborhood instead of the high speed. Wouldn't change anything about its ability to accept extra traffic on game day or when the interstate is backed up. Uh, we also, you know, uh, in the picture, took the liberty of illustrating a tree island in the third lane every once in a while. Wouldn't inhibit any left turns, but it would give you that reminder that in this place when you drive through, there might be kids and grandmothers and so on in this town, uh, so drive carefully. See that again? Before, 
after. That's the most subtle before and after I'll show you. We'll come back to that. And now we did add one more step in the before and after, and that is coming back to those missing trees I mentioned and adding them in. It's a pretty small thing. But when you go back to existing conditions, you can see the small things, like whether the street tree was ever replaced after it was knocked down, uh, can be pretty important. So, we'll have a chance to poll you on that one in a minute. Now let's come a great, uh, a great many miles further to the west, to the area around the Meridian Mall. You already saw all scrawled on all those maps. Mixed use, denser, walkable, residential, village, surround it. So, uh, Kenneth Garcia uh, last night did this quick series to show you the what ifs for this kind of place. Several people specifically say, I don't know how come all those big empty parking lots aren't thought of as potential building sites. That was in some of the presentations Wednesday night from the table. So that's where we started. We said, what if the next generation of growth and change, however modest, is hooked up with the idea of your new uh, transit possibilities because of the busway? And it's street oriented in the way that I was describing it. It's mixed use, so we have some things above others. Not every building has to be multi-story, some can be one story. And then, what if they're set forward instead of set back and they have doors and windows opening towards the street? But again, pretty small. In a moment I'm going to show you from down on the ground what that could be like. Am I still on? No. no. Testing. Oh, there's the mic? Okay. Let's try this one. Can you hear me on this mic? How's it going, sound booth? Yeah. Is the lavalier back on? Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I'll stay on the podium. Walking around is probably slowing me down anyway. I'll pick it up. So what if? What if the first um, new buildings that come in the area are actually part of a new vision for the place? And they're set forward. And then what if the ones that come after it, you know, are also set there? So here's an illustration that of a time sometime in the future when you want to extend on that station square and make a new main street. And because you're mixing the land uses, you can be really efficient with the parking, but eventually you'll reach the stage where surface parking isn't efficient enough. It's hard to imagine that now, but their time will come. And so basically building your way out of your problems as the next generation of growth and change comes. If in fact in the end the big boxes, uh, as many have predicted, uh, turn out to be obsolete or replaced with more contemporary formats um, as you leave the 20th, 20th century behind and then you enter the 21st, uh, there's of course the possibility of thinking that could be part of a bigger network of blocks and streets and placement. I should do that again. I know it's kind of like being put in the car and jerked from first gear to fourth gear and you get whiplash, so it's okay. <laughs> Take a minute. What if? before, after, after more time, or in the long-range prospects. It's so just a different attitude toward the real estate when you think these are addresses, not just parcels. No, this one's a real shocker. So down on the ground, we, we took a photograph and Steve Price scanned it into the computer um, and then started altering it to show what if. So in the first picture, the, the arrival of the busway. So on the far left of, of your screen, you can see the bus rapid transit has some dedicated lane, it runs in the center, it stops at stations. It's much faster than being stuck in traffic in the peak hour. But Dorian, you were here, we're looking toward the east of Oakmas Road's in, intersection with Grand Rivers in the distance. Uh, and so off in the very back of that picture is Best Buy, towards our left, the golf place and Payless Shoes tour and right the Walgreens. So first things first, you know, the relocation of red wires, the, the arrival of the busway, set in its own dedicated lane where someday if you get to the point where that would make economic sense, it could be upgraded to uh, light rail or street cars. And then I'll just take it another step. This says, what if the right of way itself is reimagined? Because we, we build on the assumption that the 21st century meridian area will not be as auto-centric or as, as auto-dominated as the other ones. So they will be willing and excited about taking the bus instead of being stuck in traffic 
or about parking once and walking around, or about using a bike. So here now you see an on-street bike lane, um, and there we go. And on-street parking spaces that that are pretty important. The on-street parking for any retail you might hope to lower toward the sidewalk instead of back behind that parking lot. So of course the mature state is the one where gradually as the buildings um, are retired and replaced by new ones. They migrate forward in the street oriented way, um, just like you saw in the overhead view. And it's not unrealistic to think that a building will be replaced now and then. And remember, the Walgreens replaced the building uh, and the Brownfield site uh, that had been there before. So this happens. You don't have to wait a lifetime for the amortized buildings on the strip pretty fast, in fact. So that gets things going, and over time, people add to it. More people park, more people walk, more buildings are added on the new addresses. And notice that the road is still the road. You know, we have some of the lanes are now devoted to different jobs, like that dedicated bus lane instead of just a through-going lane. But the but now it's an address, and we're making the public room. And others come behind that and add more. I like how Steve added the uh, the girl on the bike in the foreground drafting off the middle-aged guy and the <laughs> the slipstream. And then we said, wait, you know, Steve, when we show people these before and after pictures, however long we leave it on the screen, they're just going to think, this is too finished, this is too decided, I want more time, I need to look at this, I need to know the alternatives. And we get that. So please remember, this is just a draft to get your juices flowing. There's a ton of technicalities to figure out about how to make that work. We can come back in October and zoom in on those technicalities. Here's one. Um, this is zooming in another way to make the street. Can you see that again? Here's the bike lane on the outside of parking spaces, the way the cyclists don't like them very much. I'm in agreement because of, they're in the so-called door zone. You open your door in the parked car. Uh, if you're not looking over your shoulder, that bike has to really be careful not to catch you on the door. A, a modern uh, way of doing it is so-called parking protected lane or a buffered bike lane. The, the little minivan there is now parked outside the bike lane. Uh, well, of course, a lot fewer passenger doors open than driver's doors, and there's a little space there that's marked. And so now there's room for the cyclist to go by next to the sidewalk without worrying about being caught by the door of a parking car. Uh, it's a little tricky. There are a lot of details, like I said, like making sure you don't end up sprouting a ton of little ugly white plastic sticks to mark the difference between the two. Don't say it anymore. It's one of those details you have to watch out for. Uh, but just to, to, to contrast that again, you know, every detail, there's three or four ways to do it. Here's another alternative to that piece of it. Here's yet another. See that? First they're below the curb, then they're up flush with the sidewalk. See that again? Down below, up above. So this one is a uh, sidewalk level cycle track. <laughs> That's a really mature way. That's sort of the Berlin way or the Vienna way to do it. Uh, there are some of these now in the United States. They're increasingly popular. Um, that's the kind of thing that would have to still be figured out. And I just use the bike as a detail because it goes with that idea of the handlebar survey where when we were standing out there to the other photograph, it's just you and a Walmart and a truck and a bunch of asphalt. What if? Oh man, that detail. Or you can leave it like it is. There's no rush. So then we got back in that helicopter and reminded ourselves, you know, this is, this is, a, this is a big idea here, let's talk about the big idea. And so we kind of did a, a, a follow-up sketch which shows that idea um, growing over time to cover a larger area. You can see the mall in the background at the top of the picture. Um, the little scene we saw in front of the Best Buy is here. The picture we were looking at before is up here just shy of the Okemos Road intersection. Instead of having a mall, and strip shopping center. When the bus gets there, that use that as the excuse for the time we upgrade and have a real part of town <coughs> for Meridian. Um, that builds on the traditions, actually, is much more like the Okemos traditional historic town center uh, and much more like the other cities. So now let's move uh, into East Lansing. I'm going to give you a tease in East Lansing to show you a little bit, but I know we need to come back and look at East Lansing in more detail in October. Um, you know that area where Grand River Avenue is going by near Bogue Road, the intersection that Hagedorn was talked about a lot. Here's Bogue and Grand River. And what we're showing you in the sketch is just the idea of the incremental, gradual, 
swap outs of the old buildings for new ones, this time done with a better set of rules. You know, in this area, the city has a form based code to control some of those things, uh, but we understand that it needs to be updated and that it, its concepts need to be extended to a larger area so that the two sides of the road can be unified. Uh, that means neighborhood involvement uh, in, getting it, in getting it just right. Moving a little further uh, into East Lansing, uh, in the Harvard campus. Here's, this is the panorama, that Tim Potter shot, of uh, that standing on the edge of the parapet as a four-story building moment. Um, when I was taking the other picture. And we know, everybody in this room, me included, wants to know, how is it all going to work when you have the busway and the, and the moving cars and the pedestrians going back and forth and the bikes and what have you, in this super sensitive section where the medium is, where the Battle of East Lansing was fought uh, several times, including in 1993, to, to come to a community consensus at the medium, um, we are. Um, we don't have that answer. So I, I put this picture here to remind you that we are, in fact, gathering data. And we're looking at it. We're trying to come up with alternatives we can bring forth. I'm actually pretty confident, based on the energy that was expressed, especially at our open house, about this, that a good solution will be forthcoming. I don't have a visual of a before and after to show you for this. You need to be involved in the in the calm community conversation about that section over the next few weeks. A great solution is possible. Um, we'll come back to that in October. Biggest word on the um, word cloud was Frandor, <laughs> the, the Frandor shopping center. Um, kind of a contradiction. Uh, economically vital, virtually fully leased, lots of cash registers ringing, many people use it, they haven't abandoned that site. Um, and yet, um, not an urban design award winner. Uh, or under the city contest in its existing setup. So, and full of potential, because even as busy as the site is, it's underutilized, and certainly turning its back on this Michigan Avenue address is not the right thing. So that whole section, really bigger than the Frandor site, much bigger, the Red Cedar Golf Course, the edge near 127, the adjacent neighborhoods, the, the uh, crazy intersection with Saginaw at the north end of that parcel, all of that needs to be the subject of close-up work in more detail. We did produce a, a what-if here that illustrates the old Oldsmobile site in the foreground, Sears in the background, and Frandor going off the frame uh, on the right side of the picture, and then across the top of the picture you see 127, and then on the left, uh, Red Cedar. So in the foreground here, in the middle of this picture, uh, is the Michigan Avenue we have now. The wonderful and wide, generous median, median and the not-so-wonderful and overly wide asphalt plain on each side of it. In Michigan Avenue. Uh, what if? Remaking it all. Uh, as it gradually or suddenly uh, does, some of the land to the south being used for uh, where it's practical to do so for income producing, uh, benefit to the city, uh, while preserving the rest as, the, as an incredible stormwater park. That's a great idea. Making a busway stop that when you get off the bus, you step out into a somewhere. You want to see that again before? Imagine getting off the bus right there. And after, so instead of the backs of buildings, you see the fronts. And here's that transit-oriented development, that the TOD that you've heard so much about, uh, for which your situation seems incredibly pregnant according to our economy. Uh, not, not skyscrapers, um, being cautious. Certainly, you would encourage people to do as much as is feasible and financeable um, in this place because they're going to be on the transit system, they're going to be in the landmark location, uh, and they need to be neat. But probably about the scale that you see there, which wouldn't be bad since it's about the like Paris. And, and then in the middle of that picture, you see the busway station. Just an artist's conception, and all subject to change, before and after. I will point out, though, that the traffic model changes. You're in that balancing of transportation and placemaking. You don't need so many lanes in that section, according to traffic engineers. What an opportunity that is. You can use some for the bus. You can use some for Shero, Mark Lane's, uh, shared with, um, with the bikes. So in, in a plan view, we start at the very crudest uh, beginning sketch of Eco Park, a uh, park on the south, um, and then a new network, a framework or bone structure of streets and blocks in the Frandor site, 
recognize that some of these pieces are locked down with leases and may be exactly as they are for a very long time. We may have to wait for pieces to become. So the nice thing about a network of blocks and streets, even green streets that are where the stormwater is thought about as a special feature uh, to cleanse it as opposed to dirtying it up, some of that might have to be implemented incrementally while you wait on other parts of it. We heard a lot about the sledding hill and the, the northern end of the park here, so that's all respected and kept in. And then Justin Falango uh, and the traffic engineer took a first crack at an alternative to the Hail Mary Pass intersection. <laughs> uh, that Mark is proud to thank you, Mark Wyckoff, for that quote. And then a, a, a big opportunity uh, to, to the west of Frandor, I'm um, just rethinking that whole outer rind or edge next to 127. An opportunity for very gentle, careful neighborhood planning for conservation, infill, restoration in the adjacent residential area. But what we've attempted to do in this little color-coded map is say all of them are in this together too. The homes, the businesses, the vacant lots, the park, the Michigan Avenue frontage. It's all one design problem should be looked at together, not just the 14 acres of the frame door site as a one-off, but rather a system. So that's a site we would recommend coming back to in more detail. Now, the, while I'm on it, the stormwater park thing is really promising. How many of you have been to see the Tollgate wetlands at Fairview Park? This is a pretty amazing thing. Another thing you can find on the handlebar survey you might otherwise miss. But it's a beautiful park that's designed to do great things for the water, so it goes into the largest freshwater system in the world, the Great Lakes, cleaner instead of dirtier. But at the same time, making a place for the wildlife and the birds and even the birders. There's a lady here taking pictures of a great blue heron this morning. Um, out there in one of the spots where uh, an, an incredibly elegant design for cleaning up the water also makes uh, makes a scenic one. It's a rookery in the background. So the birders love it. The birds love it. What's not to love? That seems like a really neat idea. And something that might in fact have more social value than uh, even a game of golf. As important as it is, played by one-tenth of one percent of the people, one-tenth of one percent of the time. <laughs> So, now, fans of Lord of the Rings know <laughs> one does not simply walk into front door. <laughs> so we're going to be really careful about this. Okay? That's it. Thank you. The traffic engineers thought of that joke. I'll say that. Well, let's, let's move to these. We're almost done, but actually we come into the climax of this because I think one of the most interesting parts and exciting parts of this is that section of neighborhood between Sparrow Hospital and Clemens, um, where you have um, people who have, have small businesses and modest homes and grand homes and historic places and not so historic places all making a go in there together and working on um, really like waiting for the corridor to be because it's the piece that they're that they have in common, Kalamazoo and Michigan Avenue are the ties that bind. And so what Marcy McAnally drew here was the idea that you darkened into a little bit darker lines, infill buildings that respect the pattern and the street and the tradition, uh, in among the existing buildings uh, that remain. So it's not a, a proposal for slash and burn kind of clearance urban renewal, but instead surgical, careful infill. I'll, I'll tell you that to get that to happen requires a reduced risk investment environment for property owners, and it requires reform of land development regulations. Uh, and it does, it's a really a ball that doesn't start rolling very fast or very far on its own without strategic investments like the bus rapid transit system. So we have an opportunity as that comes in to start a new day and really kind of stitch back together and showing that principle of infill, both residential and otherwise. And the building pipes that would do that aren't hard to figure out. First, you know, you have to have these main street storefronts, some of which have, have grown out from the front of former houses, other, others of which were built as stores. Uh, so the, uh, there's a pattern and a way of a grammar for how the buildings meet the street. Same thing happens on the cottages and bungalows and houses, where the front porches are the way of meeting the street instead of the storefront. So the recipe is, in fact, there already. What's missing is uh, a, the kind of um, a completeness or, or connectedness, you know, the continuity uh, that people look for. And, of course, the opportunity to up the quality level with each new grade of building. 
So these are not photo simulations, by the way. They're photographs of real places. Uh, and all possible. There was much discussion in the housing meeting about the missing middle. You have apartments and apartment complexes and you have dorms and so on. And you have single family detached houses in the entirety of the corridor. You don't have many of the other things in between. Attached houses like row houses and townhouses, duplexes, live work units, uh, apartments and condominiums above shops. There's actually that whole middle range. The crucial thing about that is that, that, that I just listed the types of buildings that many of the millennials will want and need as they come into home buying, and many of the baby boomers will want and need as they retire and move down or simplify. So that missing middle is the market in the coming 25 years. The way to get that missing middle to feel comfortable uh, to the developers and, and uh, housing specialists is and makes it financeable. Uh, it all comes back down to the rules. There's a sample page from a form-based code. Uh, the city of Lansing has a form-based code experiment underway. We're recommending that that uh, tool be looked at uh, as a potential tool for this part of the corridor. Now, someone took a section of the corridor near um, Michigan Avenue in front of uh, Sparrow Hospital, and on the, on the aerial maps of these Wednesday night, they took a marker and they scrolled, scrolled that dead zone around that area. And we went out there to look and see what they meant. What they, what they were talking about was uh, buildings that, when they are in the right place, are kind of sealed to the street and turn their back on the street for the most part, uh, or are just simply boarded up and waiting for a new tenant. But there's a kind of feeling of vacancy and absence uh, in that area. And so we did an analysis to uh, get to the bottom line about it. Uh, pink is pretty healthy, and um, the rest of the frontages on the street and block is pretty unhealthy in terms of that street <coughs> building relationship that I've been talking about so much. And so the dead zone corresponded basically with that hole in the center. So the suggestion here is that over time, as you fill it in, and you build new buildings, you grow the hospital, and, and its neighbors put their properties back to work, and you do that in still uh, with the form-based code that I was talking about, you do it towards putting those built environments back together. That walkable environment becomes more continuous. Uh, and then the dead zone will disappear. So what if? Here's existing conditions. Uh, we're looking up high above Michigan Avenue, and you can see the tower uh, of the hospital in the center of the frame. The sky bridge right in the middle here, just to orient you where you are. And then, what if, bit by bit, as things are built and added, I'm sorry, this, that's what I'm saying. they are designed in such a way, positioned in such a way, to fix those frontages. Step that back again. Basically, it's a strategy for allowing the hospital to grow while helping the neighborhood grow its way out of its problem. Um, and in the process, we went ahead and replanted the street trees that are missing on Michigan Avenue and assumed that rebalancing of traffic, transit, and walking and biking takes place in the avenue itself. So let's move our last step now east and we're looking back toward the Capitol Dome. Here we've illustrated something uh, far simpler, but we thought it appropriate to end on uh, the symbolic picture on that grand axis toward the dome before and after the busway. It's simple. It's just a part of the road used for those dedicated lanes. Mm -hmm. um, an opportunity as you go for beautification, uh, like the median and the stations, of being part of an identity and a newness. You can see the transit vehicle uh, in the back here. It doesn't have to look like those old tired buses. It can look more like a train. You can have three doors on the side that open all at once. You have doors on both sides. So when necessary, the platform can be in the center or on the flanking outside edges. But uh, how about that kind of thing as a foreground for the Capitol or for new construction uh, as the remnant properties near the stadium are filled in and replaced uh, over time? What if? Now, let's stop and see get some, get some reactions. <laughs> Be a rule against letting consultants go on so long that the batteries in their lavalier microphones wear out. <laughs> Thank you for your patience.
we want to get a little bit of information about how you use the corridor. So first, um, we want to know how often you walk, bike, or ride transit to work or school. One for often, two for occasionally, three for rarely, four for never. The poll is open. If you need to raise your hand, if you need to keep that pulling your life. And the poll says, about equal amounts between often and never. So the trick to this may be, in fact, getting some of the rarely and occasionally to move over into the often column, while recognizing that many people will stay in never on this question. Next. Now, how would it, what would have to change to change your vote? So, um, if you're one of those people who said often and you're using it for commuting, you would answer one. I already do it. Um, but then you have other answers. I would take transit to work if, two, it was cheaper than driving, three, it was faster, four, it was closer, or five, I would never take transit. <laughs> Poll is open. Five seconds. Look at that. If it was closer and faster, how is it? Well, one of the great things about the busway is that it has very short headway, which you may wait five or six minutes uh, for the busway, and, and could even come faster than um, not 20 minutes or an hour between buses. So that's pretty exciting. Next. I'm going to show you some pictures, and I'm going to get gut reactions. Okay, please don't overthink it. Just give us your, your blank reaction. You can, we, do you like this idea for M43? Uh, in the residential segments I showed in Williamston. Um, one is for not good enough, you can answer one through five. With five is I love it. Uh, three is I have no opinion. One is not good enough. Two and four in between. So it looks like a lot of people are in the probably or that or yes category. Others have questions, which is natural. We'll record all these results and we'll probably ask this question again in future meetings. Next. Showed you an idea for the Pokemon Meridian uh, part of Grand River Avenue. Uh, which we looked at the before and after in front of the, the Walgreens there. And we're wondering about this as a model for the future retrofit of the suburban centers along the corridor. Between one and five. Five is you love it, one is that idea is not good enough. Poll is open. Okay. 87% maybe or definitely. Okay. Now here's the aerial view that I showed you around Sparrow Hospital, uh, kind of an example of a special site along the corridor, one of those 28 stops on the bus rapid transit system. Is this a good enough model for future infill? One for not good enough, five for I love it, two, three, and four for in between. Now just a couple words about what happens next. 
the ultimate next step is that if you're excited about some of these ideas, you have to A, plan to come in October, and B, you have to tell other people about it. Tell your leaders, your elected leaders, tell your you know, postcard, your newspaper, editor, whatever way you want to express yourself. Come on the website and so on. Your input is needed. You can use um, a, a site that's part of the uh, strike ending website and available to um, through the Michigan Avenue Grand River Avenue website. It's called the Mind Mixer. You, know, you can go on there and see the other ideas that others have suggested and say, I second that idea. Or I would second that idea if it was modified this way. And I'll write your answer. So that's, that's one of the ways that you can take the next step with this starting tonight. Um, you can also post ideas. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, I hope that you'll bookmark these websites and come back to them as new information is posted. We're going to put everything you saw tonight up there so that you can get, go back to these pictures, squint at them in more detail, and start asking hard questions before we zoom in closer in October. Uh, we've wrapped part one, but we have to um, uh, do the second round of this where we look in more closely October 24th through 30th. So, mark your calendar with that idea. And then um, there are three online ways to participate. First, the website, mygrand-charette, two R's, two P's, dot com. You can go on there and connect to everything else. There's also a Facebook page. And then third, there is a Twitter handle. You can write directly to us through at mygrand13. Or you can write about it and have everybody else who's following that topic on Twitter uh, using hashtag mygrand13. But this is the way to follow us for updates, review the draft, and uh, see the ideas on the website. Well, I think before we can stop, do we have one last question? Yes. I was just wondering if you could uh, define here. Yeah, Charette. Charette, yeah. Charette is a, uh, one of those words we should have probably taken right in the beginning, but we should have defined that. Uh, Charette is an intensive, a uh, very public, round-the-clock way of uh, catalyzing the design for a planning proposal in a short time, uh, even if the subject is complex, using the ideas of many people at one time. Um, so, uh, in, in this case, it means a week-long brainstorming session. Uh, so, we have You've got it. You've got to understand it. Consultant's always a little nervous about asking this question, but I've got this big podium to duck behind. Do you think that what you saw here is generally on the right track? We know questions are made. Do you think it's generally on the right track? One for probably yes, two for no opinion, three for probably not. The poll is open. I'm going to duck now. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Amy, we have that handwritten the uh, yeah. alpha going out. Does everybody have the question here at this point? Your job tonight, uh, we can bring the lights up now. Your job tonight uh, is to fill that out so you give us some specific feedback. And then step out into the lobby to see all the drawings and things posted on easel so you can look at them close up and talk to us one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you very much. <laughs>